charge the voids, it's time for a podcast. <laughs> Good evening, Ben. Good evening, buddy. <laughs> you all right? I am all right. How are you? Mate, I have a serious question to start with. Oh, go on. Will it, will it affect the sound quality if I just play the soundtrack for Pacific Rim in the background for the for the entire episode? I don't think so. But people might not might not hear what you're saying, then. Well, that's not much of a loss, mind. No. We'll get an <laughs> argument from me. <laughs> Absolutely. So, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us in episode 29, which is uh, one more than 28. It's pretty epic, isn't it, dude? <laughs> it's one less than 30. I think that's more important. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> I was like... I, d- I never did subtraction very well, to be honest. But um, anyway, enough wittering. Um, tonight on the Hobby Desk, we've had some requests about weathering. Um, since our uh, conversation about transfers took the internet by storm, um, that's a complete over exaggeration, but we had a chat. Um, we've been asked to, to chat about weathering, so we're going to do that over a few episodes, but we're starting with that, uh, that tonight. Um, I've also been painting some Lord of the Rings. Uh, Ben's built some Titans, I think. I've seen them. And um, he's also raided the local shops for cotton wool. So that's uh, (laughs) also a good chat to have. (laughs) Into the Galaxy of War. So Titanicus now bestrides the, uh, well, hobby table behind me. So we'll definitely be chatting about that. I'm sure Ben will have something to say because the, the mighty and glorious Space Wolves are returning to the galaxy um, in style, Woo-hoo! and uh, yeah, <laughs> you're excited. I expect you you were kind of thinking I would just say something derogatory or completely ignore them, weren't you? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, no, none of that. They are awesome, and um, kill team as well. Get some more stuff in the mortal realms. There is a flaming cow as a <laughs> new endless spell <laughs> to talk no jokes about. about mothers-in-law <laughs> no 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 um and uh and ben and i are going to discuss the fire slayers because uh we've got a little plan there that we want to do and then obviously as ever community shout outs and in the wild um a little thing called dune is going to come to role playing near you thanks to medipheus so we'll have a bit of a natter about that as well you, have i covered everything dude I think so, but probably not. No, probably. I always forget something or add something in. So all that remains to say is, guys, grab some refreshments. We will see you in the Hobby Desk. Hi, guys. Hobby Desk time. Um, episode 29. And uh, we've both been really busy, actually. Um, some awesome new releases to get our teeth stuck into. But um, let's try and start at the beginning. Your Lord of the Rings, isn't it? First, yeah, yeah. So um, I have been carrying on with my um, army of glorious orcs. Uh, you know the, those those that race known for their honour, um, dignity, dignity. Yeah, personal hygiene. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I've been cracking on with them. I have done. Oh, oh, one minute. Important moment. My coffee is arriving. Oh, and some grapes. This is a this is a pee on a mission to uh, to lose some weight. So it's grapes tonight and not chocolate. Mm, mm, mm. Right, bye. Sorry, guys. Right, I'm back. I'm back. I'm ready to be refreshed. So I have been painting. What have I been painting, Ben? I've lost my train of thought now. You Moran finished off Orcs. your wag as well. Oh yes, I finished off my wag. Who joined me a little while ago? in the battle companies and um i also this week i have painted 10 moran and orcs and um a mordor Arek high which i thoroughly well i started off not thoroughly enjoying but once you break the back of the armor the moran and orcs are pretty much done so that's fine uh so then you started done. another 10 yeah yeah i thought so uh, i've started another i think it's eight actually and it's it's a bit of a motley crew it's an orc with a banner four plastic orcs that i didn't paint when i painted the original warband um two more mordor uruk high a chap with a drum um let me just look at i think that's it yeah it is yeah so i'm painting them as a little batch they're through the base coating stage now so i'm on the 
the layering and highlighting now of each of the elements of them. Um, and then after that, I've built and prepared a siege bow, which you can't use in battle companies, but I built it anyway. And a shaman, because if I roll a five, I think it is, on the evil advancement, I get the transfix power. So I thought I've got just the guy, a hero, Lunrat, the uh, the orc who was but a w- orc warrior this time in the last podcast, but is now a mighty hero of great renown. Um, well, he has one fate point, to be fair, but <laughs> <laughs> he's cool. But he is destined to be uh, a shaman, so we'll see how oh, that cool. goes. Either that or he'll die. Yeah. You know what, Ben? I didn't lose a single miniature until the elves joined the field. Really? Because they... I, I can't win a game with mine. Two people have died. Two of my, like, actually dead from the campaign since Tom's elves took to the field. I know, it's outrageous. So, yeah, I've been doing that um, with my orcs. So, yeah, that's Lord of the Rings. I'm loving it. It's quite nice, actually, mate, because the models aren't that big. No, The only challenge is that they're because they're quite old, there are times when I look at something and I'm like, hmm. What on earth is that? (laughs) What is that? Where does it end? Is it just filler? And if it is filler, Mm. what colour shall I paint it? My favourite is like where you've got some of them have got like a spear or something held across their body. But between the spear haft and the body is just blank plastic. Yes. And I'm like, well, have I got to paint that to look like the ground? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, to be honest, overall, it doesn't impact it. And um, I've covered the bases in gamers grass tufts because they just have such an awesome range of different tufts and they do flower i got white flowers and i've got greeny type flowers and i've got purple and they've flowers. done those um they've done those ready made bases now which look amazing yeah yeah really good really good um so yeah been uh, oh and i've been listening to the fellowship of the ring um what i love about it is i'm like 14 hours in i think and they've just left rivendell yeah, I'm like, oh my goodness, <laughs> but I am loving it. It's great. Rob Inglis is the guy that re- is the does the recording. And oh yeah, because some... we were. I was asking about that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Rob Inglis. He does some great voices. So does he? Yeah, not not you know his his Goldberry misses the beat a little bit, but he could be forgiven for that. Yeah, but yeah, I he's also. A, he's a... I did go around, we went out, where did we go? Harriet and I went somewhere, and I was going along humming away, and she was like, what are you humming? And I was like, I'm humming. Um, Ho, Tom Bombadil, Tom Bombadillo. His coat, it is very blue, and his boots are yellow. Because <laughs> all the songs just get stuck in your head. <laughs> Amazing. So uh, I can't imagine why they didn't put that in the film. <laughs> <laughs> it's the pinnacle of music absolutely so um absolutely now i lose track a little bit on time you finished your death since I the had... last podcast haven't you yes so i'd done um the ram the chain rash chain, boards chain rash boards before and um i did the other half of the um box set um this time Mm-hmm. And I well, it's a weird one, isn't it? Because sometimes I'm a very much a fan of of order armies, um, good armies, because I like the narrative behind them more than I do evil armies. Yeah. So the armies that I tend to like the, with the evil, there there tends to be a, a sense of character, a different character about them. Um, like orcs, that there's a humour about orcs that I just think is wonderful, and always have done. Mm-hmm. Um, I Night Haunt have kind of caught me off guard a bit, and I think I gave it away a little bit last week when I was going on about like how sinister I thought the the new two units were. Um, but there's so I've, there's so much going for them, dude. Like colour wise and model wise and the releases that are coming out, they're all just fantastic. That what I thought was going to be, oh, I'll just paint them up and they'll be done. 
I've kind of fallen in love with the army quite a lot. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm now looking at, oh, I could add that in and, oh, I can add that in and like coveting the, uh, the coach as well, the black coach. So next time so, I talk to you about the fact that I love chaos because I like the miniature range and collecting the range and you just call me a filthy heretic. Oh, you are a filthy heretic. Yeah, well, you're you're a creepy skeletal beast. Yes. <laughs> that's <laughs> what I'm going to call you. <laughs> no, but, that's um, cool. Yeah, I'm really enjoying them. And um, so I went out and bought the army book as I was well. going to say you sent me a picture of the army book. Yeah, I, it's um, it's it's cool. It is interesting though, because like it's a new army book, isn't it? As in, it's a new army, and the difference between that and the Stormcast one that was released at the same time, um, you can see which ones had the meat stuck on the bones due to time, if you know what I mean. Yes. Um, yeah. Um. So it, I, it's an excited. I I'm really I'm really chuffed with how people responded to them. Um. So I, it could be easy for me to say, oh, the colour scheme was all my wonderful idea and, you know, it's not. Um, so for those of you who aren't on our Facebook page, I, I put out a bunch of pictures and I said, you know, which ones do you guys like? And um, luckily people chose the one that I most liked, which was by a chap called Slow and Purposeless. Um, that's his Instagram tag. That's not his actual name. Um <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the clarif- clarification. Um, but it just helps people track him down. Yeah. And um, he had done this very realistic, gritty style that just, it was just me, I think. It's my style of painting. And um, so I ran with it and really enjoyed doing it. And, and people have, have, have liked it. And I think I was a bit disappointed because. When I first chose them, I thought, or when I first sat down to do them, I thought, oh, I could do some really bright and funky colours that I wouldn't normally do. Um, and I think I had this conversation with you at the time. And then I painted my test one and I was like, yeah, but this is just more of me. It doesn't go outside you of my box from, at all. I'm going to go for, from my sort of weathered look to bright and funky to actually you went the other way and went even more deep and <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah. dingy. Yeah. But it, it looks great. And it's got a really good reception. It's got some really good interest. So I think, well, well, I said to you, I think you should be properly proud of those. And what's really cool is a number of people saying, oh, can I use that? Can I use that? Can I take that idea? So you've got where you got the idea from um, originally. uh, That's kind of moved to you. You've added your own touches to it. Then people are picking up on that um, and hopefully using that to inspire and drive forward their hobby. And that's what the whole social media thing is about. So that's really that is, good. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I love social media for that. Um, the transfer of knowledge is that's where it's at its best, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and some of it is actually worthwhile as well. <laughs> I've done a guide for people to copy and they're more than welcome to. Um, that's why I did it. But um, I've really enjoyed them. And I think that surprises me the most is, is just how easy they are to paint. And how robust they are, considering how little um, contact they have with the base. However, if you drop one in your rug and stand on it, it doesn't survive that. <laughs> okay. At all. Um, so one is currently on my desk having extensive plastic surgery. So speaks the voice <laughs> of experience. Yep. Um, and otherwise, uh, Titanicus. So I, I started to paint my Stormcast, got them base coated. I've had to go with the cream coloured base coat rather than the bronze colour. Um, and now I'm having to paint in the bronze and it's very quickly become apparent that they are not going to be anywhere near as fast as the old Stormcast were. Um, big sigh, but there we are. Um, but then Titanic has turned up and I was just immediately distracted because the so models were So you told me you weren't going to open that until you've got your box set painted. I never said I wasn't going to open it. I think you, I said uh, I was going to paint Actually, it. You said... No, that is not true. You said you've um, you've got to finish that set before Titanicus arrives, is actually what you said, to be fair. Yeah. Um, yes. Anything but, other than that is a vicious rumour. Right, okay, I see. I did, mate, I can't blame you. Flipping oh. gorgeous. Although, like, 
you you messaged me and you're like, "What have you started building? The Knights or the Titan?" And I was like, "I'm reading the book. Bu- the book. <laughs> I'm reading the background." <laughs> and then I was like, "And now I'm building the scenery." <laughs> I tell you what isn't fun: the little counter things that go on the 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 Titan control no, cards. I saw that. I saw somebody post about that. <laughs> oh, cleaning the- <laughs> after I'd like done the mould lines on the 50th one I was quite happy to throw them across the room <laughs> but there we go um, Only I put together the two warlords of that and I, I'm in love with that model it's so good yeah. it really is good it articulates beautifully, the detail is phenomenal um, I can't wait to get it painted and I've chosen my legion is going to be the warp runners because I found a picture of the flame, flamey version of the Warp Runner Titans behind some rogue trader space wolves. So that's me done. That was my choice easily made. Great. And I could, and I couldn't find another Titan Legion which officially fought alongside them. So, <laughs> well, so um, I Ben um, Ben the base and I split the Grandmaster edition. Um, yeah. And we bought a one of the seventy five pound sets that's like four of the twenty five pound sets at a reduced price for terrain. Yeah, yeah. And then Tom, Tom the Tank, ki- very kindly after he got carried away and bought an extra Titan, so he's got three, um, gave us the scenery from his Grandmaster edition. Um, really? Yeah, because. As he said, he'd never get round to it, and and he pretty much always plays here anyway. So that's nice of him. Yeah, it was. It was really generous. So we've put all of that in. So we've got quite a bit of scenery. Um, we've been working on that. It's really interesting. It's not, I, it's not that easy a kit to work with if you're used to the, because often you'll find with the game switch kits, you know, that bit fits there and that bit fits there, and, that, and they almost click into place as you go. Um, yeah. But these aren't like that. Um, no, they're not. They really aren't, are they? No, especially if you want to do a long like frontage to a building. That's quite yeah. challenging. Um, I think it's worth explaining why, because if the buttresses join the pieces together, yes. but the pieces have got beveled edges, and the buttresses have got like a triangular pointy edge. So yeah. the only bits of the of the kind of wall section that fit together is the very point of the bevel. Um, and then you've got to glue the buttress on. So it, it, it's quite a fiddly little thing. And the buttress has got to be the right height, although it's not touching the floor. And I, I agree. I found it a lot harder than I thought it was going to. Yeah. In the end, I just laid out the tiles and built the sides lying down. Yeah. And then put them into place. But I was thinking of using the floor and actually sticking them to the floor section. Yeah. I tried that as well and got myself in the right pickle. Did you? Point. Oh. Yeah, but you, uh, you know, you might not. Um, th- so it is an, it is a nice kit. It's um, it there's too many doors. This was my latest rant. Uh, well, it wasn't a rant, but I just said to Tom like, there's there's quite a lot of this feels like there's quite a lot of pieces with a door on, which I suppose there would need to be, but it means you end up with doors halfway up a building. Um. So then you build, you can build balconies on and stuff. So I suppose it's not, it's not that bad. Either. But the doors are massive. Yeah, I know. But there are. I love the little tiny door in the big doors. Oh right, I, I hadn't properly looked at that. Okay, mm. cool. There are some it's tiny like... doors when you look closer. Um, so that's quite cool. Um, it's interesting when you actually start thinking about the scale because obviously the Titans for war engines they are massive. But yeah, if you look at the buildings, I think I think the tallest building, a war house, a warlord is about essentially about twelve stories high. Yeah, but when you think about like cities and skyscrapers, you know that's not actually that high. <laughs> Although I say that, if I looked out of the window of a twelve story and saw the head of a war machine looking at me, I would be a bit like, "Oh, yeah." And considering the war warlord is virtually half the size of the imperator on that piece of artwork for Horus Heresy, um, yeah, that's the imperator. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I think um, 
certainly with the stuff Ben and I have built, I said to him, I'm a little bit concerned that we've not put enough height in it. Um, yeah, yeah. But then I suppose the thing to remember is that you draw, presumably, I, I say presumably, I've got the rule book behind me, but I, I won't flick for it now. You would draw line of sight from the weapon. Hmm. Which means if you think about where the line of sight would be drawn from for one of the volcano cannons. Yeah, um, yeah. Which which will bring in the manoeuvring thing that is what I was keen to do with the scenery. Because actually, I think that that scenery could swiftly get very expensive um, to do yeah, a I battlefield think... with big pieces on it. You know, some yeah. of the pieces I've seen created online and some of the ones from the Forge World people, you you know, you're talking quite a significant number of kits to to create them. Yeah, I'm thinking you need or it would be useful to merge them with some scratch building to make a, like a larger base and then have the height. Or either that or look at something like TT Combat's drop fleet scenery. Hmm. Oh. To, to you know, to bulk out the height bits. It's interesting that, isn't it? Because although there's been a lot of talk about the scale, actually, when you look at it, it scale. You know, ten mil stuff seems to work with it, even though it's eight mil. Um, certainly, N gauge model railways, which are, I think, standard gauge UK standard gauge railways. The N gauge is. Um, in scale for millimetres is about nine mil. Yeah. And um Z gauge, which is one smaller, is is seven and a half mil, but there's a lot less stuff around for that. So that opens up a little bit of possibility around model railways. Um, yeah, and yeah, also yeah. even if you want to just use these really cool new models for playing Epic, I think as long as you don't use any other Titans, the old Titans it's still going to look great because they're still just going to look like massive battling robots. Yeah. Isn't yeah. it? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. It? You know, so so that's pretty cool. Um, but I've... Ben and I have decided to make some plinths for the buildings to sit on. Yeah. Like on the Forge World boards. So I've um, made up a, a bit of a, an edging for that out of plastic guard and I've had a go at casting it just while we were setting up and that's gone quite well. So... Um, Keen to, keen to do that, and that'll give some height. And the other thing we thought about doing was putting. I've got some plastic card that looks like corrugated iron. Yeah. Um, and doing some um, sort of apex roofs on some of the buildings. Oh, that would be really cool. Again, to add height. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. To get height in there. So, and he's made a flipping massive, great beast of a building with a landing pad on it. Um, that... I've said I want to go online and try and find a Thunderhawk gunship, like oh, one of the old yeah. Epic ones. Yeah. But um, that's probably quite expensive. Yeah, they will be now. Yeah. Mm. So, dude, we ought to move on to weathering. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> weathering. This episode, what we were going to do is outline our our thoughts and approaches to weathering, um, and then work through as we go through the the future episodes. Work through. Um, particular aspects of weathering in yeah. more detail. Yeah. Um, so weathering, uh, we, weathering is a quite a, a, a difficult topic to get all in one go. And even when it comes to sort of your approach to it, because a lot of weathering is to do, in my opinion, with your, your personal preference. Yeah. And, and there will be some modelers who don't touch it with a barge pole because they want their model to look um, clean, just off the production line, however you want to put it. Um, and that's awesome, you know, and everyone's hobby is different. Uh, so there will be some people who like the exact opposite, and that is to make something look as realistic as physically possible. Um, I think a lot of techniques you can get from, if you're looking for sources, you can, you know, uh, Scale model magazines, when they look at building tanks and modern modern day military equipment, is a great place to start. Um, and I think what you need to start with is an overall idea of, of what you want your army to look like. Whether you want it to look 
brand new, like it's just turned up on the battlefield, or whether you want it to look like it's in the thick of it, and how much of of, of what sort of aspects of weathering you want to bring into it, because there's a number of them. Um, and Dan, please just jump in and add stuff, because I think this is going to be a, like a back and forward conversation is going to be best. But dirt is a big one, and I would always um, advocate making sure when you're thinking about dirt that you're you're thinking about your base at exactly the same time, so that your the dirt that you're choosing it, it is, if not coming from your basing material, but um, a color matched version of it. Mm. Um, actual battle damage, um, so yeah. big holes, um, chips in armor, um, you know the stuff where you've you've impacted into something works well, really also, well. On you can, like power you can armor. even do stuff like a bit more. Especially if you're in in 40k and you want to set it in there, you, you know things like plasma burns. Absolutely, um, yeah. I, I've seen a few articles over the years on that, and loads of this stuff is just you can find how to do it. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's that. Um, then there's day to day chipping. Um, so bits of paint scuffing, um, decals that you've put on, like weathering them so it looks like the paint's chipped off, um, and sort of. You know, shading on the model itself, and and then I think gore is is one that should really strongly be considered if you're doing a close combat army. Um, so, and there are other things as well you can add in. But well, I think I, the, so one that I was going to chuck in was some um, like heat heat bloom on weaponry and oh um, yeah, yeah 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 absolutely and also yeah. like exhaust stuff which is. Is heat bloom I find quite difficult. Um, it depends how good you are with your, the tools you're using. But things like um, scorching out of uh, out of vents. I mean, you only have to look at the side of a rhino, and there's a load of vents. And and a light dry brush with um, with a black, um, or if you if you do use an airbrush, a spray of, a, of an airbrush with the black, is a really simple way of adding something that's quite effective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the say, you know, similar sort of thing with exhausts that you can do as well. Different techniques for that, um, and and oil as well. But I I kind of include that in grime and mud, dust, etc. Yeah, and um, you know, there's lots of places out there selling stuff for that. So AK and Inter- Interactive is a big one. Um, Mig do a number of things. So um, I suppose there's one other thing to go with weathering. Um, and that's when something that's got super old or disgusting. Um, so rust. Um, yeah. And choosing what armies to put rust on is a is a big choice to make. I don't put rust on any Space Marines. Um, I avoid it like the plague. Um, and I don't actually um, put rust on anything where I think there's a warrior ethic to them. So anyone who would be cleaning their weapons... Um, to any degree, even if it's just oiling them and rubbing them down, like my how I imagine my iron jaws, I uh, I don't do rust. Whereas things like my night horn, they get rust, and then extra rust because yeah <laughs> they've been they've been in the ground literally. Um, and I suppose the last one to think about is 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 only specific to some ar- armies like um, snot and bile and all of that goo stuff that comes with Nurgle and various other things. So there's a number of things there, I think, but I think the key is to get the balance right. So a little bit of each is far better than going over the top with one of them. Mm -hmm. So you add together, I think, a a subtle kind of palette of maybe three or four effects um, to come to an end result. And the balance between them is really important you, if you spent hours working on your model and then you've just covered it in blood, I think you've done yourself a disservice. Um, and it's the same with all the other weathering effects, really. So I think building up the chipping, the battle damage, you know, then the dust and then the gore, and then coming to sort of a balance as to what you've got left, I think that's the most important thing because if you do too much of any of them, it can look weird. Yeah, because I think when things are natural, when things look realistic, it everything is kind of random, and um, 
a bit of everything that it comes in contact with. Um, so that's my general approach to something, is I will look at my army, I will decide what I want my army to be doing, where it is and what situation it's in. I will then paint the model, go for chipping or something like that, the, the sort of wear and tear on the armour. Then if I'm feeling adventurous, um, I might really do some battle damage, but I tend to have modelled that in before I painted it. Um, then I will apply the grime and the dust and then the gore. Um, rust comes in when I'm actually painting the model you know, itself because I think that's a, that, that kind of comes early on because then stuff goes on top of that. What you're looking for is to get the, the, the stuff that would come on top done last so the grime, the dust comes last. Um, and that's how I approach weathering. Cool. Well, and so... You, Pardon? You've used um you use quite a lot in your salamanders. Yeah, and so um t- I think that there's a few things I would add um that I would consider with weathering. So probably the first thing to think about is um what your models what you're weathering it, it, uh, you know what you're going to be doing with it because if you go online and find out some of the scale model stuff, it looks stunning. But if you picked it up and put it in a case, picked it up, put it in the case, played games with it, picked it up, put it in a case, that it would lose a lot of that. Um, and very you know, rapidly, weathering powders is is a good example. They're notoriously difficult to get to stick and adhere to a miniature. Um, mm. Especially, you know, if you imagine every time you're putting it in a case, especially if you've got a case where your models are you know, you want them to be held in place. Those models, uh, you know, that weathering powder is going to be getting rubbed and rubbed and rubbed. Um, so it's really worth thinking about that. I think that's really important because the last thing you want to do is put all that time in and not um, and not uh, gain anything from it. Um, and then I think the other thing <laughs> that I say quite often jokingly is like, why are you choosing to weather an army? Because when you're thinking about your army, it might be that actually weathering is an option to speed up that painting process. Um, Or if you want to do it different ways to, um, you know, make each model particularly, you know, because you can do all the chips and stuff by hand if you wish. So, And I think the example of that is like with my salamanders. So because I was weathering them, there were literally bits where I'd notice I'd missed something and I didn't really care because I just weathered it and it disappeared. It went away. Um, And that helped me speed up my painting. So I think some basic weathering techniques can be a really good way of getting an army to look effective uh, on the tabletop Um, it, it quicker. Yes, yes. I think that's worth considering. So those are my considerings for weathering, mate. Yeah, I think um, they're both really good points. So Um, the the plan is, if I'm right in saying, that we've obviously had a bit of a chat about it there. So some of those techniques that you mentioned over the next episode, couple of episodes, we will look at those techniques and talk about our experience with them. Um, yeah and as we always say it's really important you know we only see this stuff i you know i've been on a couple of painting uh courses um and uh ben goes online looks up a lot of stuff don't you watch a lot of videos so all this stuff is out there it's not and we are definitely not experts (laughs) no no not by any means but what we are is a couple of hobbyists who use some techniques and that's what we're going to talk about awesome okay yeah so i think what we will try and look at next week is chipping and battle damage. Chipping and battle damage. I do like cool guys. chips, dude. I I do. Big, juicy, Cornish chips. Yeah. With cheese. I like them with cheese. Yeah. Mm. Chips. Right. <laughs> On to the Galaxy of War. <laughs> yeah. See you there. Welcome back, everyone, uh, to what is at the moment 
a rather exciting Galaxy of War, isn't it, Ben? With all the stuff that keeps being announced. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty ridiculous, isn't it? Oh, mate, that's insane. That's insane. Orc speed buggies of doom. Yeah, I, I don't even... Yeah. <laughs> it's just... There it's is. so hard, isn't it? Um, where do we start? Well, we. I, it struck me um, in between segments that we said we would talk about Titanicus, but we talked quite a lot about Titanicus in the Hobby Desk. Um, because neither of us have actually played a game yet. No, we um, haven't. No, no. Uh, I've watched a few on <laughs> on the interwebs, um, but I'm gonna get some stuff built up and and try and get game in. Um, I suppose the only thing to say is it's flipping awesome. Yeah, <laughs> the the quality of everything in there, the card stock and all the rest of it is really really good. Um, it is. The yeah. dice are really nice. It's it's a wonderful game. The production production value of it is is excellent. Um, miniatures are excellent. I I did also. Um, it occurred to me actually while well, you said it in the hobby desk, but um, you and I are are doing the same legion, mate, or legio. Are we? Yeah, because you just said you're going to do warp runners, aren't didn't yeah? you? Yeah, yeah. I'm doing warp runners. I have been for well ever since. Well, as for a long time, I found that I've got a poster of the Reaver Titan on the back of my door. Really. Yeah, they're the ones from Lucius Forge World, and they can teleport. I thought, um, I thought you were doing the Inferno one or whatever it was to go with your salamanders. No, no, that was a concept from a fair while ago. I was going to come up with one. I was going to make my own. Ah. Um, and do like fiery ones, because, um, because the the Inferno, I think, is the fire wasps. Ben is doing. Yeah. Ig- Ig- um, Igneous or something. Ignatum, yeah, actually, Ignatum, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I do think of doing tempe- Tempestus. So, yeah. well, I quite like their colours, but... Um, oh, cool. Yeah, but they didn't have transfers at the moment. That made me sad about Tempestus, because I really like Tempestus, and the story with Princeps Cavalario is really cool. All oh, right, OK, yeah. Indius Cavalario. He's in... Um, he's in Mechanicum. Book Mechanicum? All oh, right, yeah. Uh, and they do like a last stand against um, against Legio Mortis on Mars. Yeah, and that's pretty cool. So yeah, uh, I've Legio. I've chosen. I've just told you that, haven't I? I this on literally. Yeah. I just said it ten minutes ago. Why I've chosen them? <laughs> no, yeah. So there we go. That's really awesome because we're gonna have a massive, great big, uh, massive, great big Titan Legion running around, getting involved. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. So I was a little bit on the fence. I did think about doing Legio Griffonicus. Uh, I think their color scheme looks quite cool with all the weathering and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, so that's Titans. They're cool. We'll talk about them some more when we play the game. Um, so Ben, at last, yep. The uh, the Space Wolves deign to join us at the feasting table. They do. They do. And um. You happy? I, yes, actually. Um, they're not. Yes, I am very happy. It's everything I expected it to be and more. Um, I didn't expect them to release Russ as a code as part of a codex issue. Um, I think we've been blessed with that new box set. I think it's a lovely bit of background, and like a nice little force and um, a great new character model. But then I was expecting a character model because the others. You know, Space Marine chapters got them, um, but I think he looks great. I really do. I think he he fits nicely with the Space Wolves, and um, it kind of vindicates my decision to paint my lieutenants as Wolf Guard battle leaders as well, um, okay. which is quite cool. Um, I think the new rules are ace. Hunters Unleashed is is awesome. I think as a as a <laughs> as an army trait, I think that's wicked, um, and. I'm gonna really interested to see how we can utilise that that six inch heroic intervention. That's quite a that's quite a little jump that is. Um It is. So that's gonna be really wicked. Um I love the saga stuff that they've done. So an ability and then you get sort of bonuses if you complete a certain task. I think that's really cool. Um I love that. I think that's re- so they got an ability and then if you complete the saga or do the deed of legend, that ability becomes an aura. Effect. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, one of them I think is um, quite interesting. Really cool. The one that they've hint that they've prequeled the beast, um, or the bear, saga of the bear. I think it is. Um, and you, yeah. 
it activates the aura if you make a saving throw. Yeah. Which means that people are going to be really reluctant to shoot at them. <laughs> with, any, yeah. with anything that doesn't have a decent AP, because it's just going to bounce off of them, which it, it kind of and makes them tougher. And it, it's going to kind of, full, it's a self fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? They're going to be tougher because people aren't going to shoot at them because they're worried about, you know, the, activating the aura. So. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited about it. I can't wait to get my hands on the Codex. Uh, would have been nice to have got it already, but um, I'm trying to avoid looking at too many um, reviews because I find that sometimes that can cloud things a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of disappointment about some models not being in there, like a wolf priest mounted on a thunder wolf and um, an iron priest mounted on a thunder wolf. Sorry. Um, and wolf priests on bikes, you know. But I, th- I can understand why Games Workshop aren't including those things because they don't make the models for them, and I can understand their reasoning for doing that. What I am interested about is the fact that they've, they've said in one of the leaks, or they haven't said, but it has been leaked, that the Primaris can succumb to the Wolfen. Yeah, we discussed that, didn't which, we? Which, uh, I've got to be honest, I'm not entirely sure I, I'm entirely... Like over the moon about that, I think that the Wolfen before. No, but I, I like I said to you, I, I think unfortunately in general, you know, the forty k universe is a grim, dark universe where everything's a little bit rubbish, and games which have a tendency, if there's a good outcome and a bad outcome, they go the bad outcome way. Yeah, you know, so I'm not at all surprised, and I know you don't like to talk about it, and I know you hate it, but. It really worries me that on that same basis, they'll do a more wolfenized Russ. I will hate that. Um, I genuinely will hate that. I, I, I will. I will hate that as well, mate. But that's just my concern based on based on the, the way things tend to go. Um, just talking, going back, because I wanted to say I saw a couple of cool stratagems for them that I thought were particularly ace. I really like the, um, the Lone Wolf Oh, one. that's superb. Yeah, I love the idea that when yeah. like he's lost all his pack brothers and then he just wigs out and <laughs> start laying into people. Yeah, I love that. Um, I love that. And also the on the hunt thing where you can put a unit, um, in well, you can basically spend a command point to put it on the yeah. hunt, and then it can turn up from any board edge, um, or within six inches of any board edge and more than nine from the enemy. Yeah, yeah, that's ace. It is, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be restricted by the um, the uh, deep strike limitations, I think. But yes. um, yeah, it's cool. I like it. I do. Um, yeah, I th- Wolf and Russ. That would that bothers me. It really does. Um, but I, I think the fact that the Primaris have, can fall to Wolfen has its pros. It makes them very distinctly Space Wolf. But I, one of my biggest things about space wolves at the moment is i think they've gone a little bit too far with the wolf and wolf and enos yeah. um and not necessarily in the models um i like the big hairy bestial looking um ferocity of space wolf miniatures that i like that always have done from you know the the metal squad leaders in second edition that's what that's what drew me to them but when you're when i was reading the um the fall of cadia and like a space wolf company just sort of turned all into wolfen and wigged out and they didn't seem to have an issue with that. But for me, that felt different from how space wolves have always viewed the wolfen, which is that it's something to try and resist. It's something to overcome. It's something to, if it happens, then, and if you can control it and you've got the mark of the wolfen and you can come back to being a space wolf at the end, then you're revered as something special. But if you've gone full Wolfen and you haven't come back, you're almost pitied um, and hidden away in the fang, practically, um, for all eternity. And I think the fact that so many of the Legion are just falling to the Wolfen is, I think, it's just, an, it's been a bit much, I think. Which I suppose was done, I suppose, to undermine how powerful they were, because they, they had gotten massive. And um, mm. But I was kind of hoping the Primaris, like... For the Blood Angels, there, you know, it said that they don't fall to the Black Rage. Um, I thought that I'm, I'm kind of hoping that the Primaris, it's clarified that 
they can fall to the wolf and but they they it, easier for them to come back again. Mm. I'd be okay with that, but whole legions of Primaris falling to becoming Wolfen and staying like that just is a bit odd. And not why I'd like it to go, but I've I've gone in a bit of a fugue about something that um, I'm actually, overall, I'm super excited about um, in a lot of ways. And the Space Wolves have ticked every box that I wanted them to so far, um, the release. Apart from the dice. <laughs> £17.50. I mean, really? Utterly ridiculous. But there we go. And they don't even glow in the dark. The thing that bothers me about the dice, and I, it's nice to get creative, and by all means, somebody comment and tell us they think differently or what have But I feel like a number of these special dice are a little bit difficult to read. Oh, yeah, the Idineth Deepkin. Dice, yeah. You know, and, and it's just silly. You know, the purpose of a dice is to generate a result. Yeah. Um. So if you can't read that result, that just to me, that's just wild. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I think sometimes they're just taking it a little bit far. Like they, you know, it'd be far happier just to have a whole bunch of dice come out that are space wolf grey color with dots on, and then the six is the wolf's head or something. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, that that would be fine. That um, weren't seventeen pound fifty for, you know. Yeah. But there we go. Hey ho! So um, I'm, um, I have already pre-ordered it. It's going to happen. I'm going to get super excited. So the next time we talk about the Galaxy of War, I'll have a whole lot more to say. I'm sure. But at the moment, I'm very excited. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um. So kill team. So a little bit about Kill Team. So there's a couple of things coming out for Kill Team or going up on pre-order. Um, the Dark Eldar and Death Watch are getting those Kill Team boxes. Yeah. Uh, with the weird scenery and that I never really got. No. Well, it was very expensive when it came out. And now they're putting it into a new Kill Team box. So I'll be interested to see what the cost of that comes out. Well, it's going to be comparative, surely. Um, so 50 quid for the, you know. You would think. Well, yeah, I should hope so. I should hope so. Um. But um, Chris, um, Chris Goff, he's been playing games of that at lunchtime. That's it, um, really? It, yeah, yeah. So he works in the centre of town. And there's a gaming club, Bristol Vanguard, have got, they, they meet in the Duke um, pub in town. Yeah. And But the, the, the bit that they use for gaming is always available. So he just pops in there at lunchtime and plays some games. I think he might have been into the games workshop as well. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, he's loving it. He's loving it. Um, I, which is cool. I've not, I've not played any yet or, or even picked up any of the stuff. I'm very interested in it, but there's such an amount of stuff at the moment going on. It's a bit overwhelming, um, isn't it? Really? Well, yeah, but basically you just can't, I can't do it all. No, you can't. I don't have the time and I don't have the money to do it all. So I have to. You know, and Titanicus was there, but that's that's fine because some people are, will not be interested in Titanicus, um, and and will be loving playing Kill Team. So, oh, and Rogue Trader, of course, as well. Yeah. Oh, do you know what I? Rogue Trader. Was I cool. had to reread that four times to work out what the point of it was, other than it's got cool models in it. Which let's <laughs> let's be very clear: the models look really really cool. Um, yeah, they do. And it's when they said that they're going to use Kill Team to explore the, you know, the darker parts of, or the li- the less explored parts of 40k. I got really excited about that because there's a lot they could do with that, that thinking. Um, and Rogue Trader is one of them. But I don't, I don't really get, firstly, why it's been released so quickly after Kill Team, and what it actually is expanding. Um. But I guess we're going to know more about that when we get more details about what it is. But um, I thought it 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 basically presented a narrative campaign element to Kill but, Team. Yeah, but it talks about it being a major expansion um, and doesn't really clarify what that is, other than it being a narrative campaign. Um, yeah, I just I think I don't really think I fully understand what it is yet, and I'm hoping it's not going to be priced around the ninety quid mark. Um, but it's going to be more along the lines of the Kill Team box. Well, it's getting a bit... It's hammering you a bit, isn't it, mate? Because you do like to have new stuff. Well, I love the models in that. When it comes out, because you love the models, I mean. And But in the, this month, we've had Titanicus... No, Kill Team, Titanicus, 
Um, and now we've got um, Tooth and Claw. Um, then this Rogue Traders due out in September, and then Lord of the Rings. That's five box sets in two months. It's, that is ridiculous. <laughs> yes. And not just like yeah. a like a you know half hearted box set, a full box set in it's crazy, absolutely crazy. And that's not including Soul Wars. You know, if you expand it by three months, by another extra month, you've got Soul Wars in that. Um. So yeah, it's 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 quite a lot. Well, it's a ridiculous amount. <laughs> you, you know, you, <laughs> I and and Speed Freaks in October. Yes. I mean, for goodness sake. <laughs> Which that I, I, I don't collect talks. I don't collect talks. I don't collect talks. I don't collect talks. <laughs> I could so easily buy that as well. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. And then get beaten half to death by my wife with my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> so also, um, we've seen weaponry for the Sisters of Battle. Yeah. Since we spoke last, haven't we? So that looks very cool, um, very stylized to. to it's on them. point, isn't it? It's exactly no. what you expect, yeah. and that's the thing. It's exactly what you expected it to be, but perfect. You know, they've, they've got the, yeah. they've absolutely nailed it. I think, and it's really nice to see that the swords and the melee weapons are a decent proportion as well. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and um, Blood Angels have got some nice kits. Very nice kits, actually, um, for Heresy, mm. which are really nice to see. They look lovely. Um, and there's a couple of the consoles have been done as well, which are like characters. Yeah, it would so. be nice to have. It's nice to have nice looking models for Heresy, isn't it? <laughs> a Warhound sprues have been have been seen now. So two on a sprue, it seems. Which is, quite is cool. it? Is it two on a sprue? Yeah. Oh, that is so good. That's going to be priced about yeah. the same price as a Reaver, isn't it? I would have thought so. Yeah, that would make sense. I would have thought that so. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. How much So that's how much cool. for the Reaver's going to be? We've got a punt at 30-something. Yeah, thirty-five between 35 and 45. So 40? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think probably... So, to two warhounds for thirty quid, yeah, that's not bad, is it? I think the Titans are really reasonably priced, actually. Can now, I've, particularly now, I've built the um, the Warlord. It's not as big as the Knight. It's not. It's not even comparable, I don't think. But it is a beautifully intricate kit, and it's well worth the money they've charged it for. Charged for it. Hmm. So, yeah. God, that was a bit of a whistle stop, Absolutely. wasn't it? It was. And we haven't it? even covered but, Cordor. No, I know. I was just thinking that. I was just looking at Cordor and thinking, oh, because I've got really excited about Cordor. There's, there's one mod. I, I've been completely nonplussed by them, really. Not really. Like, I've appreciated that they're nice models, but they haven't really captured me. And then the community team have put up this model. I don't know whether it's going to be a bounty hunter or a character or just an alternate alternative leader um but he looks stunning he's just got loads of candles on his back a bloody great axe across his front and straight away i was like i gotta do cordon <laughs> and i want to do them with red robes yeah that's my gang that's the gang i want to do um because yeah i i don't know i don't <laughs> i really don't know i just got super excited uh and again chris who um who i'll be playing some necromunda against this week hopefully, has... Uh, I sent him a picture and I was like, oh, this guy's amazing. And he said he's got to be extra special to fight with that axe and those candles without setting himself on fire. Yeah. <laughs> so I love that. To be honest, if he set himself on fire, he probably would just see it as an extra opportunity. Um, Closer to the Emperor's light. People. Yeah, absolutely. So, that's my excitement about Cordor. I haven't done a lot with it, so maybe I'll talk about that more next time. Yeah. I think. Okay. Yeah, I think that wraps us up, doesn't it? For Yeah, very speedy. Um, guys, let us know what you're thinking about all these cool new things that are coming out. Pop them in the Facebook. <laughs> I'm going to go and see get you. some refreshments. You're getting some refreshments. We will see you in the Mortal Realms.
Hi guys, and welcome to the Mortal Realms. Um, we're going to start something new this week because uh, we've been asked to, effectively. So we've been asked by people, um, uh, effectively, what are the things that we, we fondly remember from the old world. And um, we thought we'd spice that up a bit by reflecting that into what they've become or how they how they kind of appear in the Mortal Realms. Um, so we're going to have a chat about Slayers this week yeah, and uh, and Fire Slayers. But um, I think before we do that, um, let's have a little look at the releases. A bit of a Age of Sigma light Warhammer Fest Europe. Very light, really. Whop- a whopping great flaming bull. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I really like, which... they've put, like, but who could wield this? And it to me, it looks like like um, Chaos Hasha, Dwarf. is it Chaos Dwarf? Yeah. Um, which would be totally left field, but that doesn't mean it wouldn't happen. Obviously, because that happens quite a lot at the moment. Um, but well, I suppose... here's something that you completely didn't expect to happen. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. And then um, some other people though have said maybe Bray Herds. Oh yeah, yeah. It does look more like the Chaos Dwarves than Bray Herds, though. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would think Chaos Dwarves would be superb. That yeah. Would, like a triumphant return to plastic. That would be amazing. Oh, dwarves. Yeah. Dwar- essentially, dwarves that have fallen to to the Chaos Powers in the time would be ace, wouldn't they? Yeah. Yeah, it would be wicked. And the aesthetic that Forge World laid out for them with their models, would be really nice as well. Really, really nice. Absolutely. I hadn't even thought of that. That's really cool. That's quite exciting looking forward, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, um, I think one of the great things about Age of Sigma is that you have got that excitement of it could be anything. Yeah. Um, whereas I know like a lot of the time when we were talking about the old world, it was like, oh, will they do Cafe? Will they do Nippon? And the reality was that the aesthetic for those, you, you already knew what that aesthetic would look like. And that's probably why they never did it. Yes. Um, but, but, that being said, there were many things that were awesome about the old world, um, such as Slayers. <laughs> nice I love Slayers, man. <laughs> I think because my... My sort of introduction to the Warhammer Fantasy world was um, the Go Truck and Felix books. Yes, and they were superb. Yeah, the early ones especially were were excellent. Um, I think the first five had a massive impact on me. Troll Slayer, Skaven Slayer, Demon Slayer, Dragon Slayer and Beast Slayer. Um, Really cool. And... I think because I before that I'd read Lord of the Rings was my sort of fantasy literature, um, yeah. And this was a kind of like Lord of the Rings plus with all the the crazy fantasy stuff in it, like airships and yeah. I mean, I've yeah. always liked the Victorian era anyway, and and technology and steam power. It it really I love it and. um so to have dwarves like in that, they've got like a little steam train and everything going on. It's brilliant. Love it. Um, but yeah, so Slayers, because obviously <laughs> Gotrek is a Slayer. Um, and I just love how flipping hard as nails they are. Well, it's, there's a lot of people may not know who they are or what they are. So Slayers were dwarves from society that felt that they'd been dishonoured or had dishonoured themselves in a way that they felt was irredeemable. Now, dwarves being dwarves, that could be something as simple as being turned down by a girl in the pub. Um, Anything which sort of damages their pride, um, there was a chance they'd end up becoming a slayer, um, which was a cult, effectively, of um, people who were looking to die Um, to redeem themselves, which, because they're dwarves, it's impossible for them to just go out and lose a fight on purpose. So 
they go out and pick the fights with the hardest thing that they can find. But they also train to beat the hardest things that they can find. Um, the only kind of advantage they give them is by doing it absolutely naked, apart from maybe a loincloth. Um, and they just added a superb character because they were borderline psychotic, complete warrior cult that would run across the battlefield and take on just about anything you put them up against. It was brilliant. Um, and the, I used to love the models because you went from a troll slayer who had a little bit of a quiff and was a bit sort of small with a hatchet um, to like the dragon slayers, which had like gargantuan hairstyles with axes the size of like houses and just absolutely <laughs> brilliant. I just loved them. Yeah. Um, and they looked like, you know, like the like predator ancients they just looked grizzled <laughs> and <laughs> they were fantastic and you know you didn't you didn't survive your first week as a slayer without um being ridiculously hard um so there was a wonderful kind of concept of process of elimination you know natural selection so that if you got to giant slayer that you were probably the best fighter in the dwarven army to be perfectly frank um and that that was always reflected. I I love them because in an army of like metal and hair, you just had this bright orange thing stuck in the middle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so good. I think for me they were one of my fondest parts of the old world because of books like Go Trek and Felix. Yeah, absolutely. There was great videos made about them as well. Like um, when Warhammer Online was released, they did that. Um, video of the dwarf slayer taking on it was the dwarf character was a dwarf slayer wasn't he yeah um and he was so good and then they fired him at the wall didn't they yeah. like on the catapult they you know they shot him onto the battlements of the catapult it's so good yeah <laughs> absolutely brilliant that's just, <laughs> just a comet of ginger hate coming towards you <laughs> yeah so they, they they were one of my absolute favorite parts of the old world um yeah, I, I really, I just echo everything you said, mate. I, I loved Slayers. I loved them for that fact that they stood out in the army, um, mm. and they were pretty awesome as well. They were crazy, a snorry nose biter with the oh yes, throw a oh, a, a yes. Mohican, so he hammered yes. nails into his head, yeah, and painted them in different they, um... colours. The interesting thing about Slayers for me is that I think it was the Fire Slayers that put me off Age of Sigma so much. And that's a big statement, I know, because but I just felt... And I remember a long time ago when I wasn't into Age of Sigma and we I wasn't doing the hobby that much. And somebody made a joking comment about Age of Sigma and you came in and like, oh, you know, Age of Sigma's awesome. And I said, how can you compare this to this? Um, and showed you two po pictures, one of the Slayer and one of the Fire Slayer. I thought the second one looked a bit ridiculous. Um, and yet, they have grown on me so much over the last two years. It was only when I went to Warhammer World and saw them in person that I changed my mind about them as an army. I think sometimes you've got to, as we're talking about the old world, I, I think it's really important that the old world was the old world and was bloody excellent, and is an excellent setting um, that I would happily go back and role play in. Um, and I've got my higher farming and play games in. Uh, it was, it was a great setting, um, but it was difficult to move it forward. It was um, very difficult. And actually, the best thing to do was to say, right, let's park that. That that has happened. Um, played a massive contribution to generating all these fantasy players and all these cool models and all this stuff and it's fantastic but we need to do something different um, and then do Age of Sigma and I made a decision very early on that I wouldn't do High Elves in uh, Age of Sigma because I wanted to draw a line under it and say that was that game, this is this game and I think that's the thing with things like the Fire Slayers, to truly appreciate them you have to understand them as just fire slayers. Yeah, they are fire slayers. They aren't 
slay. They are not troll slayers, but in Age of Sigmar, they are no, fire slayers, which is a completely different concept. And the only thing they they obviously share is they share some aesthetic because that's a cool aesthetic. And yeah. why would you not want to have it? Now, are the troll slayers still part of the dispossessed? list i think you can have a hero one but he's called like he's not called the troll slayer he's called something else i can't remember what that is some people are like darn it's this it's this but i can't remember what it is so i'm gonna look it up quick phil i can feel easily phil because today i i sat down or this weekend actually i sat down and i read about fire slayers for the first time and, dude, they are awesome. <laughs> so the unforged the be- is what he's called. Well, that, yeah, that makes sense because a, a fire slayer is forged, which comes on to awesome. So, I, there's going a lot of people listening to this. I'm going to be sucking eggs, but just seriously, this is my excitement. So they're god Grimnir dies fighting a massive fire serpent and gets scattered across the mortal realms as this kind of energy that absorbs into gold and turns it into Ur-gold. Volcatrix, mother of salamanders. Yeah, that one. And it's <laughs> an energy... Get- Look, I'm, just, I'm on my excitement wave here. <laughs> I, know, I know, I know, I know. And they're trying to gather together all this gold so that they can like mine out the Ur-gold. And then this bit was just awesome. I didn't know that those little runes that they had all over their body was actually Urgold hammered into their asses. How awesome is that? <laughs> and then when they want it, they get the energy from this Urgold and turn themselves into like fiery hate monsters and bounce off attacks off of their skin and chop the heads off of Dra- Dude. Why did you not just tell me about that when I was whinging about them? You wouldn't have liked it. You, you, I think I did, dude, actually. I think I probably had a similar conversation to what you've just said there. Because, you know, I get excited. And you were probably like, oh, that's ridiculous. How would that even work? But I've up until now, I've been like, oh, they're just mercenaries who, you know, go around the mortal realms annoying people. But they're not... They're doing all this stuff so they can get the gold, so they can get their god back. And, oh, yes. But this is the irony, is they actually use that power and it burns out the runes. It disperses the power when they use them. Does it now? Hmm. Oh, dear. So they're wasting their god. Yeah. But it might be a bit like Jet Li um, in the film The One. Yeah. So as they burn them out, like all the remaining ones get a bit more power until eventually there'll just be one rune and it'll be it'll be Grimnir. <laughs> Some fire slayer will draw on the power of his rune and his flipping god will come out of his bicep. Be like, I'm going to have you. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> yes, wouldn't it? But Grimnir has to come back. I'm sorry. That picture of him decking that fire serpent like mid-air like a fiery comet oh yeah yeah. so i saw that picture when i we went up to warhammer world uh i'm pretty sure i don't know what did we go for something me and some guys i can't remember if it was straight after it came out it was very early in this is a great story you went to warhammer world to see something yeah, but we went up to Warhammer World. And anyway, on the TV screen, that picture came up of him leaping yeah. towards... And I, I, oh my gosh, was like, mate, just amazing. <laughs> it's before the fire stairs that were announced or anything. Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, just a stunning piece of art. Really cool. So are we still going to do a joint fire stair around me? Because I'm now pretty game for that. Um, well, my pause is simply because every other project I have committed to doing, I have failed to do so. Only the ones with me. Well, y- w- yes. I'll tell you what. Would you like to do a joint fire slay army with anyone but me? And pretend that... <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll pretend I'm the other person and give them the models. Oh, my 
goodness. I'd love to join a joint fire slayer army with you, dude. We do fire and ice. I'm so set on that that idea. Be wicked. So come on then, talk about that idea because I don't know if we've talked about idea. We probably have. Where your side would be like the the dark skin with the fiery beard, and I'd go for like a blue icy effect in like a you know, oh, like gas fire. Oh, like gas fire, just like that. Apart from the little poo gas thing that British Gas had as their, or was it Eon, <laughs> the little flame that looked like a poo in their adverts. Not like that. The, an actual blue flame. And I had thought of, I was thinking before we started about having them on a snow base and having under their feet, because I've got a newfound love for cotton wool, having a bit of cotton wool coming out so it looks like the snow's melting as they walked. I Well, you need to try it out and have a look and see what it's like. Yeah. Absolutely. But yeah, yeah, I think um, I'm quite keen for that. Be my See, first... in the... Um, it, sorry. Um, in the rule book, it doesn't actually mention the thing I said about them using up the gold, using up the power, but I'm sure I've read that somewhere. Well, I haven't, I haven't read it today, so it might just be one of your little fantasies. Well, I did have the Fire Slayer Battle Tome for a while. But you sold it. Yeah. I don't talk about those things anymore. It makes them too sad. <laughs> yeah, probably. Don't sell your stuff. Thinking about the future of Age of Sigma, because I've been talking to a few people about it, because Soul Wars has come out. I think it's great. I love the new changes to the rules. I love the more the um the magic, the new you know persistent endless spells. spells, endless spells. Yeah, thank you. And um, but. One of the things that I've, I've really started to think might happen is a, a kind of a kill team version of Age of Sigma. A skirmish version of Age of Sigma where that kind of sim, that same, sort of same product idea and hopefully Mordheim, but not Mordheim. Actually, if they re-released Mordheim, would they keep it in the old world or would they bring it into the new one? I think that they would... I think if they call the game more time and, and release it, it will be in the old world. And it will be that would a recreation be a, of that game. Be a really exciting principle. I wonder if that's why they haven't sort of rushed into it, because they're trying to work out how to do that. Yeah. But anyway, I think a Kill Team version of Age of Sigma, where you're building a little war ground band, like a, a kind of expanded version of Skirmish, would be, I think that would be wicked. Yeah, yeah, with definitely. the same sort of same sort of product support, um, I think that would be really, really cool. Right, well, yeah, anything can happen. So, matey boy, should we head over to the community? Yes, to the community. Oh, we could ride there on a flaming bull. Yeah, <laughs> you'd get a bit of a sore butt. Yeah, quite possibly. Awesome. You'd look cool. You would. You would. Unless you fell off it backwards, then you'd set yourself on fire. You would. Shall we actually move on now? Yeah, why not? Hail to our wonderful community. How are you all? Yes, they're good. They're good. Hey, so um, this is the part where Ben and I chat about things we've seen online that we thought were really cool. And then we usually do a breakdown of events based on the very cool calendar that Ben has put onto our website. And I occasionally remember where it is um, and add some things myself. But it is very good, actually. I use it to um, look at what shows I want to go to. Well, that's the general idea, so I'm glad you like it, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> it's excellent, man. It's excellent. So, um, shout outs, Mr. Hall, you first. Yep, so I've chosen two with a Space Wolf theme um, this oh, time around. Oh, goodness. I know. I'm sorry. I really am. Listen, so the... I, I maintain my positivity about them coming right through to Galaxy of War, and now you bring them up again. Oh, yeah, definitely. 
Look, get back in your box for a second and let me talk about oh. some wolves. So the first one is uh, Ian Robert Craig on Instagram. Um, and it's literally spelt as it sounds. Um, he has done a fantastic Space Wolf Kill Team. Um, lovely balance on his weathering. Um, and the the bit that really sticks out for me is on his sniper, he has the raven shot on his, sat on his shoulder. Um, I really, really like it. Um, so I'd like to give a shout out for him because for me, I think that they're some of the best primary space walls that I've seen um, on this way around. It doesn't look like he does space walls all the time. They're not his army, but I think as a, as a good example of a kill team for space walls, I think they're top. Um, and the second one, a lot of people might have already heard of actually, um, is Uplander. Primarily does um, a 30k space walls, but his his uh, site is um, is literally filled with space walls. So if, if you are interested in space wolf collecting, then really you can't go far wrong with going to have a look at Uplander. You've already gone completely wrong. Why? Well, you said if you if you're interested in space wolf collecting, you can't oh. go far wrong. You can't. But you've already gone completely wrong. Thanks, man. Do you know what I'm going to say? I know I'm just butting in because I always do. Behind me, I got out. I forgot to bring it up. The third edition space wolf codex. Yeah. Does it burn your hands every time you touch it? Well, don't you think it's interesting that you know I complain a lot that I've sold off everything and I've really sad because i've not got all that stuff anymore but one thing has survived lurking on my shelf because it refuses to be beaten down dan that's so wonderful do you know it's i don't know they don't even put they're so embarrassed by how small these codexes were they don't put the page numbers i've told you that i said that i have literally said that before 33 pages and that includes the back inside back cover Yep. It's dire and amazing. So um oh, Uplander is spelt with two Ps if you're searching for a two Ps, ha <laughs> no pun intended. Um on uh, Instagram. And um his most recent project has actually perhaps might have convinced me to buy some of the uh Viragia, actually, 'cause he's he's dremeled the fur off and actually without the fur on them they don't look too bad. Um so that's quite encouraging. <laughs> so there you go, Uplander and um, over to you Dan because you have some people you want to shout out don't you? well I've done my usual thing where I've had to scroll down through the uh, the 2 P's hobby group um, which I've seen a few people been joining um, over the last couple of weeks so welcome to you guys thank you very much, uh, it's really cool seeing stuff popping up I particularly like it um, if I'm you know, at work or doing something I don't want to do because it just goes bing and then I get really happy seeing some cool hobbies. So thank you. So the first one was Mike um, has put up work in progress on the mountain from the Fire and Ice um, game for Game of Thrones, dude. Yeah, and I was talking about on a couple of weeks ago, wasn't I? If there was a Lord of the Rings, uh, Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones game, I'd be really interested in that. So. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's looking really good, Mike. Um, thank you for putting that up. And uh Chris and um, Chris, I'm sorry if I make a mess of your second name, but Abagnale has put up a chaos kill team. Mate, I love it. I think it's really hard, if I'm honest, to make those old Chaos Marines look um like they fit in the current setting. Um or in against the current sort of miniature ranges, because uh, they are quite dated. But with the chains and things that he's gone for, I just love it. I think they look really cool. I think it's also very hard to make Chaos look unique nowadays. And the grey that he's chosen with the the kind of warlock purple plasma glow, really, I've not seen that before, and I love it. I think it's great. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? I think... Um, all I would say about if you are going to paint grey is just to um, actually pick up corn red and use that instead. Um, that's my sort of feedback. <laughs> 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 what 
Although I haven't painted a corn model in so long, mate. I I don't even... I don't... Where's my corn red, too? In oh, the my goodness. Bin. Throw it away. Ditch Not even putting away. red on the orcs. Mad. Anyway, quick. Back on point. That's the second time I've done that. So those are my shout-outs. Oh, and I did want to do a quick shout-out. I have no idea the name of this person, so it's a very accurate one. But... And the chances that they're listening are small. But someone from um, the Great British Hobbit League, I think it is, uh, Chris, his warband was joined by a Lake Town militiaman um, who you couldn't buy. Not a militia. It might be in the militia. Yeah, it is a militia. Um, and they, you can't buy them in the blister anymore. You could only get them in like a big £40 set and you only need one. So he asked if anyone had one, and somebody just sent him one. No, no charge awesome. or anything from the States. Um, and, and when Chris said, but what do you want for it? He said, all you need to do is do the same for someone at some point. Pass it on. Like yeah, with another model. So special. That's that great, is. isn't it? How yeah, cool is that? That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, great bit of, hub, yeah. of community right there. Yeah, ace. Really ace. So it's, uh, it's calendar time. And as normal, we'll go over the upcoming events over the next couple of weeks. Um, there's a fair few little things going on. I think we'll take us up to the 15th, I think, Dan, of September. Okey-dokey. So um, this weekend, um, which will be the uh, 25th and 26th of August, on the 25th is the Games Workshop Truro store birthday. Um let me just run past the other stuff to make sure there's nothing. Oh, yep, on the 25th in a curtain, there's a Bolt Action Annihilation Tournament. I, do you know, I'm so tempted to get myself into Bolt Action, but I'm resisting, desperately trying to resist. Um, and on the Friday night is um, Friday Night Magic at uh, Terra Games, um, which is quite an you know, ongoing thing in Terra. Um, moving forward a little bit into the next week is the Age of Sigma Second Edition Slaughter, um, uh, which is a tournament at Game at Curtain Games again. Um, that is a one day event. That's when I I like one day tournaments. I've got to be honest. I find two two days a little bit overwhelming, but um, yeah, that was pretty good. And uh, two days is quite. I don't know. Sometimes it depends. Some one day ones can be a bit too intense because they try and squeeze it all in. Yeah. Um. I did true. a one day one with three games, and that was enough. Two two day ones. Um. Can that? Well, that yeah, they can be quite tiring. Yeah. Yeah. So especially when you're standing up all day, if they haven't got any seats, then um, they are just, just sound like two old men, don't we? Big. And uh, okay, moving on to the fifteenth, which is the following weekend after that, um, there is the Antler, uh, the Colours two thousand and eighteen, uh, and that is in, up in Berkshire. And the Outlands guys are going to be doing intro games there. So if you're local to Berkshire, then head on over and see Ross and John, and they'll show you um, Outlands. And I think that is unless I've missed anything. Oh. Did you miss Curtain Carnage? Did I hear you talk about that? I've just completely gone over that. Yeah, sorry. Curtain yeah. Carnage 2, which is a 40k tournament. That's another one-dayer. Um, and that is on the 8th of September, um, uh, on the Saturday. Um, I just want to add an event in to prove that I remember it. Um, so it's the, it's the 20th of August when we're recording this. Yep. Just so, like... It can be confirmed that I knew about this. I remember this before it happened. The 20th of September is my wedding anniversary. <laughs> okay, yeah. So um, I'm just remembering that. On uh, on September the 9th in the Bristol Independent Gaming uh, is the big Kill Team campaign day. Um, and on the September the 15th, they've got Kings of War tournament, the, em- the Emissary of War. Uh, on the 16th, uh, an Age of Sigma 2nd Edition Tournament 2. So it's a pretty busy time, isn't it? It's always busy. That's one of the nice things. A lot of the um, 
sort of hobby areas, the places that have got gaming tables, etc. You know, one of the things that they need to do in order to to survive is is run lots of events. So there are lots of things going on that you can get involved in, which is ace. Um, I have missed one. Sorry, it, apologies completely. Curtain Curtain Games are running the um, X Wing Two release night on the thirteenth of September, um, which would be pretty wicked if you're into X Wing. Then I, I I think that release days are always awesome. Curtain does a great job of them. So, well, and they they're big into their X Wing, aren't they? They've run a number of very large uh, events for it. So if you are interested or, um, you know, or you've played before and you kind of want to know a breakdown of the changes, I would imagine the guys there or certainly some of the customers that go in there would be really up on that stuff. Yeah. So I think um, it's well worth going, even if it's a bit of a trek, um, you know, within the Southwest, I think you, you would find quite a hub of of good information if you went to that one. Well, and just as an indicator, the, the X-Wing 2 release night for Curtain has got 63 people planning to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if you are into X-Wing and you are in the southwest of the UK and you want to find out about X-Wing 2, where better to do it when the 63 other people are going to enjoy it with you? So Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that is us for the next two weeks. Ace? Well, next two weeks in a bit. Yeah. Awesome. So, guys, if you want your event on our calendar, give us a shout. If you want us to shout out your event, then just let us know. Particularly if you've got a number of events, what we can often do is share the calendar so you can enter them yourselves. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If you're if you're duh, a local duh, duh. local venue and you want to do that, just, just give us a holler. Or a games club. That'd be good. Yeah, all games club. Yeah. Righto. Shall we move into the wilds? The wilds. Hi, guys, and welcome to the wilds. Woo! So, um,. Something big came across our desks that I'm really excited about, and um, I do like a good bit of role playing, um, especially when it's you know it's all your mates come round and it's turned into a kind of like a proper social evening, and I can't think of a better setting, Dan, than June. <laughs> so good. Yeah, I mean. A lot of what 40k is comes from June. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's kind of benchmark science fiction, isn't it? It's, it's right. It's kind of almost the Lord of the Rings of the science fiction universe. Yeah. It's the sort of, it, well, that's the stuff that the guys that, that, you know, the games designers, the background writers, etc., at Games Workshop, especially initially, would have grown up reading, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. yeah that and Conan the Barbarian. Yeah. Yeah, and things like the that Alien kind of... films and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. But I, if anyone's going to do it a decent shout, it's going to be Modifius. So, yeah. Um, the, yeah. And we can expect to see some decent models to go with it, because they've done models for their other role-playing games. Yeah. Um, talking of Modifius, have you bought... Because people have started getting their copies of the Fallout game, haven't they? Uh yes, and no I haven't. And I'm I'm kinda of sad. Um it just dragged out for such a long time that I've ended up spending my money on Titanicus and Kill Team and... I think that is a bit of a risk with the Kickstarter um approach. Well it wasn't a Kickstarter. I thought it was a Kickstarter. I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Oh okay. I think it just took, it's just taking its time being released. Oh right, um, okay. For various production reasons, and people pre-ordered it quite a while ago. Ah, I see. Um, but you know, it is, well, it is what it is. Um, I really want to play it. I more, if I'm being honest, I, I, I want to model it, and I think I need to give it a couple of 
months, like a good four months to do it justice and make a nice table with, um, I'd like to go for like a suburban table with like a suburban building with a, a play park and, you know, a, a ruined car or maybe a four by four board. Um, really do a nice job of that. And, um, I paint up some of the characters and do a nice job of them, but, you know, it's always, it's difficult to find the time. And, and like you said, it's, there's always a risk when you get in, you releasing a product, you build up the hype too early and then it's gone. And I think a little bit for me that that's happened. Um, yeah, but there we are, you know, I'm sure I'll find it again. Um, I'm sure I'll find it again. I've got my a- Alien versus Predator to do as well. <laughs> Just finding the time, isn't it? Yeah. Well, especially when there's so much else going on. Um, mm. It's interesting, actually, because when we started the podcast, um, having Into the Wilds just seemed completely natural because we were we were certainly interested and still are interested, but interested in other things and, and looking to be active with those things as well. Um, yeah. painting up different stuff, you know, I, at the time I had some bolt action I was planning to do. I had some flames of war, drop zone commander, drop fleet commander was really exciting. And actually, saga. and saga, yes. But what, what has happened is, um, and you know, I don't mind because I love it, but games workshop have ramped up so much that I'm just, mad busy on stuff i love that they're doing Um, yeah which which has meant that (laughs) into the wilds has has um has not had as you know as as much diversity in it you know as uh as it had previously yeah yeah it's 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 a tough one isn't it um it's a tough one well there is only so much time you know even if money was not an issue you can't buy more time <laughs> to do things yet yet yeah indeed <laughs> if you're a scientist out there with crazy sort of time saving ideas then throw them in our direction um i think the other thing i'd like to talk about isn't is um dwarven forge um if anyone knows dwarven forge they they do scenery like resin scenery that you, you, can, you can use to construct, namely role-playing environments, I think it's fair to say, isn't it, Dan? Mm-hmm. Um, more than wargaming environments. But they've just released a new, or launched a new range, and it's a forest, and it blew my mind. It's so good. Um, so natural-looking and rugged and textured and... I I could drop so much money on that. Um Oh yes. You see, when you said Dwarven Forge, like a little thing in my brain had a bit of recognition, but I couldn't quite remember. And I've just gone to their website and yeah, I love their stuff, mate. I absolutely yeah. love it. It's um that forest for me that <sighs> It's <laughs> it's one of those things where when I'm imagining how I'd want to play uh, Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or insert fantasy role playing, that's that's the image I had in my head of a board. Yeah. Because I mean, how immersive do you want to get? You may as well practically be watching it on television if that's painted up nicely. Oh, mate, so good. Oh, it's excellent. Isn't it? So so good. Yeah, it is. It's absolutely stupendous. I'm really excited about it. But I can't see that being cheap. Oh no. But it's it's you know, if you've got the if you've got the pennies, then then I, I think it's well it's well well worth oh, yeah. it. It's that nice. is. Well they've been going twenty years as well. Yeah, they have. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what it started off as was, was um, I think, just sort of dungeon bits, so you could, you know, build a dungeon with the walls and the doors, and and you know, it's just it's it's expanded into something really special. Um, 
if you added their stuff together with other companies like is it, is it tabletop scenics they do the buildings we've talked about them before oh, i've forgotten their name oh um yeah i know who you mean <laughs> they're beautiful buildings aren't they with the with the forge and the the warehouse and the, oh, the I'll leave you to Google search that while I'm trying to remember the name. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that that was my that was my two things for Into the Wilds Dam: Dwarven Forge and Dune role playing. Yeah, well, Dune. Uh, yeah, I again, it's like. It's almost frustrating. You're like, I need more time. Just need more time. Because I really wanted to do the Star Trek role play, and I got massively excited about that. Um, yeah. And that never got anywhere. Because the thing is, it's not just you don't just need time. You and the, the group need time, don't they? Oh, role playing is a nightmare when it comes to that. Because, I mean, it's hard enough to arrange a, a, a war game with someone where it's only two of you. And you have to find a time where you can both meet up and play it. Is that's tough for some reason? I. But role playing, you've got to herd a whole group of cats together at the same time, and I find it really hard. And I've been doing a role playing group, as you know, with um with Ross, and we ended up all being spread across the country. So a lot of it's been done digitally, doing roll d twenty. And it's just not the same. I don't. I haven't enjoyed it as much as I did in person, um, because I don't know a few of them at all, and um, I've never met them in person. And like I said, for me, role playing is often about the social element of sitting around and, you know, chatting, having a laugh. Um, some of my fondest memories of working in Games Workshop was all of the staff heading down to Star Mountain Cafe, and you know. Glitter scape and keeping it open until God knows what time in the morning, and I just was role playing every week. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I thought it was amazing. Good times, um, but that's easy because you just got we just got everyone in the store plus a few hangers on, and just you know went down there and did it, um, and it was a weekly thing. But you know, as you get older and you have responsibilities and stuff. I think I think it is genuinely a hard it's a hard hobby to organise. Yeah. It is. And um I think Dungeon Masters have got their, their work cut out for them when they're trying to sort it out. Yeah, absolutely. Um Tabletop World. Tabletop World. Yeah. Love their they stuff do some so really much. Really good river sections actually actually. They do. Yeah. They do. Like, but they're and they're made to be mounted into a board. Oh, that's yeah. Cool. Ace. Is there anything else for our Into the Wilds? Nope, I don't think so. Not this time. Not this time. Uh, what things I would, you know, if people have a game that they play, Gaslands. That was the other thing I wanted to talk about. Gaslands. That board that we shared on the um on on our, our Facebook page absolutely totally got me fired up for Gaslands again. I've been in Morrison's desperately trying not to buy every Hot Wheels car they have. <laughs> I just I, I I really want to get stuck in and model some machine guns on the sides of Bugattis and stuff. <laughs> I just don't get it, man. You don't? No. Nope. I think it's... I like the aesthetic... Um, it's a bit of Mad Max. Um, but you re- you love Fallout. And a, and a world of Fallout, to me, it just doesn't... I, I'm not into that post-apocalyptic thing as much. Um, and I, I suppose the thing for me about Gaslands is why would I get a Matchbox car and slap some machine guns on it when I could just go and buy a Land Raider. Because the Matchbox car costs about... I know, there's, I know there's the cost element, <laughs> but I'd rather save up and not buy any Matchbox cars and have a tank. But 
if it helps people play the game and stuff, you know, get into tabletop gaming, it's ace. So I, I think the thing that I really like about it is, is the, the book is cheap, the cars are cheap, the tokens and that you can print off and stick on card and, and use those. Um, and like with any war game, I think you, you can just play it on the kitchen table using, you know, upturned egg boxes as scenery. Um, so the, the, it's not, it's just a, it's a really easy buy in. Yeah. And I think from the other thing that I really like about it is that Tristan has lots of Hot Wheel cars and it's an, it's a nice way for me to move him from, you know, just pushing them around the floor into a game that is playable and is a step in the direction of the hobby that I love, which is tabletop gaming. Um, so I think it's a, it's a really good gateway drug, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is I think one of the reasons why I really like it, and I love the idea of getting one of those little toy cars that is just a model off the literally just off the shelf in the supermarket. And you've talked about one of the advantages of Games Workshop is that products is that you can literally just get in the car and go and buy a paint just from down the road normally, and. Um, well, it's the same with this. I can I can go and get a new car by, you know, as I'm strolling around Morrison's. Or, yeah, yeah. And I think, oh, that looks cool. Like I was in Asda the other day, and they had um, the Jurassic Park ones, and it was like a big Humvee Land Rover thing. And I was like, oh, that would look good. Um, and I love the idea of getting that and turning it into a, a thing. With um, I think it's a, it's a bit of an extra challenge. That's all right, mate. Maybe it'll be like um, Age of Sigmar, and in twenty nine more episodes' time, I'll be buzzing about it. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Be God. I think the other thing is that you can take a, like a car that has inspired you or you like from the modern world and turn it into, you know, your little kind of post apocalyptic chariot, which I think is cool. So there we go. That's um, that's my little rant about Gaslands. <laughs> cool. Well, I think that is about it for this time. Yeah, that is all, folks. I would say um, don't forget Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can get us. It's at two, the Two Piece Podcast. Yep, and we're on YouTube too. And um... we are on YouTube. And Ben's done a video. I have. It was very crazy. Yeah, it was my mobile phone. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think that's it. Um, One of the things that we are talking about doing is um, is setting up a Patreon, um, which we don't want to talk about too much stuck on the end. But um, just as a thought, because it is quite expensive keeping everything running, um, more than we thought it would be, uh, and certainly quite expensive with the plans that we want to have moving into videoing. So um if if you know I we'd love some just as a if you got to the end of the episode, then you're probably a person <laughs> who actually listens to what we do. And uh if, if that's something that you you know think is a good idea, then before we, you know, dive straight into that, just would appreciate some feedback and thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Well we always appreciate feedback and thoughts and it's nice. Um it's nice to get it. Uh, nice to show that people are listening, which is great. And always a bit of a shock still. <laughs> but yep, it is absolutely. great to hear. Um, so, yeah. if um, Don't forget to join the hobby group. Get some pictures up. And, um, yeah. Enjoy your hobby for the next couple of weeks until we're back. Woo! Woo! And I'll have a Space Wolf Codex. I'll have a Space oh, Wolf Codex. Oh, no. That's it. Three three downloads <laughs> on the next episode now then. <laughs> right, see you later guys and gals. Bye. Bye.